Welcome to Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I'm your host, Levi Strom. On today's episode, I speak with Will Shaw, founder and CEO of Grind and Grow Chicago, about self empowerment through cannabis. I got involved with cannabis rather late, actually. Um, it was, I didn't really get involved with cannabis until like right as I went to college. Um, so I was, and I went to I went to college a little late, so like twenty one, because uh, I went to community college before going to university. Um, so I was a I was a child of the Dare program. Um, they came to our school. Um, even weird, more weird, the cops let us get in the back of a cop car. Cause I don't know why they thought that would be cool for children, but um, yeah, right. so I was the hard I, plastic. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I, I just remember my parents going like, "If I ever hear that you do something like that, you'll have to deal with us." So, <laughs> um, but but yeah, I was I was a kid of the Dare program, so I really wasn't. I was anti anything that I had the like, propaganda. It was like if it was like crack heroin, it was just like all of it. I was really educated in that way that like cannabis was a bad thing to do. Um, and so it wasn't until I went to college that um, me and a friend that I was on a gymnastics team was like, he was going to the Marines. I was going to college. I was like, why not? And so we just kind of had a night of just like hanging out smoking. And um, it was really weird. Cause like everything I heard about it was like, it's very bad. And all I just remember was laughing the entire time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so in college, I mainly didn't really, I really didn't partake until like maybe the middle of my semester um, because I was one, I was one of those people, especially like on my, like I started wearing a Rasta hat before I smoked. So people assumed I smoked just from wearing, they assumed I sold because I had on a Rasta <laughs> right, hat. Right, right. And I was like, nah, this is just. But that's what that's for, life. right? The drugs are in there, you know? Yeah, I guess. I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and, and it was so it was really interesting because I didn't get involved until it, it, it was very secretive at first. It was kind of like if you were my friend and I knew you smoked, I would smoke with you. But to everybody else, it was just kind of like, no, I don't smoke. Um, But then around college, it became, so it shifted into more of a recreational socialization tool. Um, And then over time, I felt more comfortable to use it on my own, whether there was a person there or not. Um, And so it kind of started off for me as a socialization tool. And then it became also, I think there were, I know there were times where I didn't use it for the right reasons, where it was kind of like I was stressed out or like having like a bad day. And then I do remember using it uh, or kind of abusing it in the sense of like, I would just smoke to disassociate from my thoughts. Um, But over time I realized it was funny because it wasn't until the end of my college experience that I actually got told that I had um, like anxiety and depression because like through the school's insurance, I was able to be like, like, there's something happening. So it turns out that my, introduction to cannabis was also helping me kind of address without even knowing just issues of anxiety, um, issues of depression. Um, but that didn't, it, and it wasn't until I became aware around that time of my mental health that I started to be a little bit more mindful of like, okay, I can smoke, but like smoking all day and sitting in my house is not something that I can do. Um, so I, after college, it more so shifted towards using it for introspective purposes. Um, it was a way for me, I mean, I still used it in a more, rec, it's still recreational purpose, but I think I, I hadn't been educated um, in my earlier years around like how to approach cannabis with a sense of like um, purpose. So and that, and that was around, I graduated around like the age of 25. Um, so it was kind of like um, around my 25 to uh, the last five years, it's been kind of like our last six years, it's been kind of transitioning towards like, how, when am I smoking? How am I smoking? Am I smoking to disassociate or am I smoking because I'm really trying to get into the mindset of something? Mm. Um, and then I started to associate it with movement because um um, I'm an artist. I've been doing uh, performance arts related movement for about since I was like 15. 
Um, so a little over 15 years. Um, and so there were a couple of people that I would hang out and we'd like, you know, I we'd smoke and go to the gym. I remember going to like export and just like smoking in a parking lot and then just going on a treadmill and I and I would just have a serious runner's lunge, like, <laughs> like a runner's <laughs> face. Um but it really helps me get out of like Wait, do that mind. runner's face again because <laughs> it, it was just really like yeah i need to get my like, runner's face on flash. <laughs> <laughs> um but no it, it really helped me um kind of get sometimes it would help me focus sometimes it would help me learn more about myself because i think there are times when you're not formally educated on how to use cannabis it's a trial and error experience sure. so you end there were times that i realized I would smoke and whatever I needed to process in, internally, cannabis has a way of bringing that to the surface. And so I would sit there, my mind would be like, so if you're smoking and your mind still can't remove this, this, this mentality you're trying to get away from, do you realize how important it is to analyze and deconstruct what you're actually feeling? Um, and that also led me to a journey of, again, back to my mental health of realizing that, um, dealing with things like depersonalization that cannabis kind of helped. It would always bring something new to the surface. Like, are you aware of being present? Are you aware of like how you feel? Are you aware when you smoke in response to stress? Are you aware how when you smoke and you move, you feel a lot more grounded in the, in the moment? And it, and, and it also allowed me to connect ultimately with the cannabis culture in Chicago um, because there was an, there was an underground scene here. Um, and I had met people through the underground, um, because at that time in like 2008 and 2018 is when I met them. And it was just kind of like, it was pre-legalization, but the culture of cannabis was one that I resonated with because when it's, it's kind of like when everyone's doing something at the time, like again, pre-legality, when everyone's doing the thing that we all know that legally we should be doing, there's an automatic like middle ground between you and people and and the culture of the cannabis community was just really cool because I, I remember walking to my first event and it just like people were just very welcoming um and it was interesting because a, a friend of mine that I met through uh Capoeira had a friend who was an entrepreneur in the underground mar market um and they sold topicals and they sold um things that their abuela taught them how to make using cannabis and was now using to kind of support their livelihood and so it was that that was like my way in and then ever since it was just kind of like meeting people in the market and then over time it was actually people in the cannabis community that kind of empowered me to be like you have all of these tools like you're 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 very intersectional you have all these backgrounds like just imagine if you would put those tools to use for yourself and so cannabis became this, this I'm, I'm using this intentionally, it became a gateway to a culture that is a lot more perceptive of individuality, as well as like seeing people where they are, as well as acknowledging each other and, and our experiences and not really being too judgmental about each other because we're all, again, like we, everyone had their reason for why they smoked. But it was it was literally just a culture of, of empowerment to me because it was the culture, the, the, the cannabis community of Chicago that kind of got me into a position of why not just start your own? And it was very interesting because I've spent half of my life in performance arts communities. There were times where my I was told I had an attitude. But then later in my life learned I didn't have an attitude. I had mental health issues. Mm. And so it was very interesting that in the performance art community, there was always these social gaps or misunderstandings, not because I'm not, an, like, I know I'm an intelligent person. I know I, I'm, I'm very well with words and because I read a lot growing up. Um, music is my thing. So I love wordsmiths. Like, like one day I'm going to meet Donald Glover just because like, that's the connection I got. But um but no, it's, it's, it was cannabis, like there were people who just literally helped me conceptualize that I had the, the capability to do my own and stand on my own. And these two, um, comparing these two industries um, or these two communities, it was just over here in the performance arts sector, an aspect of me could come forward. Where in the cannabis community, people were just like, what else do you do? Like, who, like tell me more. And, and so that 
was really kind of my introductory introduction into cannabis. It, it started off recreationally and just over time consistently became just more about awareness, more about connecting with people authentically um, and ultimately led to a reconceptualization of self of, of that I would rather be a part of a community that acknowledges my needs and acknowledges the holistic perspective of who I am. And that, and, and I would rather be a part of that than to consistently try to play this game in a performance art community. Cause I can still do everything I do in a performance art community with the cannabis community. Like, you know, that's where the classes come from. I've been teaching for 15 years. I've taught, you know, circus, I've taught dance, I've taught gymnastics, I've taught, you know, when, when I had a master that allowed it, I, I've taught Capoeira, um, even like did music when I was younger. And it was interesting because there's a lot of politics in those areas. And I'm not saying that the cannabis community doesn't have that, but I would say I'm, I've been fortunate enough within the community that I now frequent to just see the culture of cannabis being, how can we help you? How can we see you? And how can we empower you? Yep. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the culture is powerful because it's like it, uh, me too. Like I, I kind of started, you know, I'm a dare kid and I started really getting into cannabis in college. And I remember being afraid because of all the programming of like, Oh shit, if I start smoking, you know, am I going to drop out, you know, am, am I, so, you know, am I going to like just become a loser? And it's mm -hmm. like, no, of course you know, I didn't. And, and I, and I found that same community because, you know, if you're, if you're smoking, you're already kind of doing something that has a stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. So like, I think everybody that connects through the plant is kind of like already stigmatized by larger society. So you kind of feel like you're a part of the subculture and, and, and it doesn't matter, you know, what brand you're coming from you know so to speak you know you, you have a place in that culture and and it is a really welcoming culture and now to kind of be taking it out and that's why i really support the work you're doing i wanted to have you on the show because you're bringing cannabis into the healthy lifestyle movement and, and you're showing and and i like how you use the word teach because i think people do need to be taught how to use cannabis and to recognize uh maybe sometimes you know the the misuse of it, which can occur, can be used uh, for escapism, can be used to avoid as an avoidant strategy. And, and sometimes maybe you need that and that's okay too. But mm -hmm. if you can also use cannabis as a tool to open up and to explore some traumas and um, may are just things you want to change about yourself or maybe areas, um, you know, anxiety, you know, that maybe you didn't realize you had that it kind of brings to the forefront and really, it really challenges you to explore mm -hmm. it because it is a healing plant and it has a psychological healing component to it as well. And, you know, a lot, a lot of talk occurs around cannabis as a pain management tool, cannabis as an anti-inflammatory. And it's amazing at that, but you know, the healing properties, even you know, THC specifically mm -hmm. of that expansive psychoactive experience can, can do a lot of good when used appropriately. And, I really like how you're bringing it into the fold of, of healthy lifestyle. For people that don't know, Wills um, does three times a week, inhale and stretch, grind and grow Chicago, um, really cool community, self-empowerment. And, you know, the branding of self-empowerment with the use of cannabis, like what is, what are your thoughts on people who don't want to use cannabis in its traditional sense, you know, that maybe uh, respect the plant, enjoy the plant, but don't necessarily want to get high. How do you approach those people to make them feel included um, and, and what you're doing as well. Like, is it a requirement to smoke before you go to um, inhale and stretch? Do you have to inhale? <laughs> no, um, because th so due to the due to the facts, right, that cannabis works differently for each person differently, just the way that our you know, endocannabinoid systems are all differently set up. I make it known that not even for myself, like there are days where I will smoke for the class and then there are days where I won't smoke for the class because I've noticed just my own cannabis use has changed over time. There are days when I would wake up and smoke. And then over time, I noticed that my, my cannabis use would become a nighttime thing. Um, so I would let, I let my, you know, people in my community know like, Hey guys, I will smoke with y'all today, but, um, I got lit last night and I'm still feeling it. So, um, <laughs> I let, I, I'm honest about how I use cannabis, um, in conjunction with my class. 
Um, so there are people like even, um, you know, luckily, you know, you know, thanks to a local um, cannabis educator here who it's, it's a black woman here. She owns her own cannabis uh, educational uh, center where you can get like you know, you can get your medical card through her, you can, you can get seeds. Um, she allowed me to teach classes and we were able to start in-person classes. And so when we had classes there, it's very important to tell people, please make sure that while you're, while Canada, again, our class, we are, we're, we're here to be moving and, or moving and, and to be very intentional about our cannabis use, please make sure that you understand your tolerance. Because we had a dab, my homie, um, Professor Dabs, we had a dab specialist come through. So you could do a dab before class, you could do a dab after class. Um, if you wanted to purchase products from um, you know, the owner, you could. But it was also, we had to let people know, like understand your tolerance level. If you don't smoke, probably not a good idea to smoke before class. You know what I'm saying? Like right. if, if you are a light smoker, like tell, tell Professor Dab, like let him know. Like he'll tell you that like, I'll give you a I'll give you a different concentrate because it'll be a little bit lighter. You'll feel it, but it won't hold you back. Um, and then I had a friend come through who was like, "I can dab," and then he realized that the dabs that were offered were specifically made. If you or or someone, because because my friend he's like a thousand milligrams is nothing to him. Mm. Um, but we we educate that because it's like in order for us to come to bring together health and wellness with cannabis mindfulness has to be a part of that process so whether i'm facilitating facilitating in-person classes or virtual classes I, I try to let people know honestly like how do i use cannabis how does cannabis uh, works for you um i'm not shy about letting them know like my ignorances in relation to cannabis because i don't know everything i understand that Sometimes CBD is my is a better friend for me, and sometimes THC is a better friend for me. I'm still learning about terpene profiles, and I let it be known because, as a as a as a facilitator, that type of perspective lets people know that research is still important. And so, just as much as I'm facilitating, I'm still going to be educated about cannabis. You still need to be educated about cannabis, um, and we also need to understand like how we're going to use this in our day or how we're going to use it in our movement. So yeah. it's not necessary that you need to smoke to attend our community because the main focus for me is more so about the culture of cannabis or the culture of, uh, of uh, there's, a, there's a book called uh, Food of the Gods, um, which is really cool because it's an anthropological study of various, um, of various things like they were all natural that pre-colonialization were just a part of black and indigenous people of color communities. Um, but then like post-colonialization became like outlawed and became like federal drugs or stuff like that. And it talks about how cannabis was just like a part of indigenous cultures where it would be like, you're gonna use cannabis because as you do your coming of age, you're gonna smoke cannabis because we need you to be mindful about your current coming of age ceremony. Or you're going to we're going to use cannabis because at this community facilitation where we're talking about certain topics or we're doing certain things, cannabis is a way to facilitate that. And I think I remember, you know, even one of your podcasts where you talked about even if you just grow the plant of cannabis, mm -hmm. right? Like you're going to be affected by it. And so it's it's that is the focal point of what I'm trying to do is how do we cultivate that historical community that cannabis has facilitated for a very long time that, you know, again, Black and Indigenous and people of color cultures and communities have already learned, facilitated. How, how do we bring that back? Right. Not just in the mental state, but the physical state. And then how can the practice of cannabis kind of be the driving or at least the hook to kind of bring people over to that yeah. perspective? Yeah. And I think, <clears throat> honestly, I think probably African-Americans and Indigenous peoples probably are the, and, uh, you know, in, I would expand that out to, you know, to include probably, you know, Mexicans too. Cause in California, I learned a lot from my mm -hmm. Mexican friends about plant medicine, mm -hmm. um, especially the ones from Mexico because <laughs> you know, people are a little bit more in tune um, within just the use of aloe, you know, and, and dandelions and, you know, people are pretty competent, you know, your average mm -hmm. person in Mexico, cause they don't have a lot of money, you know, they mm -hmm. can't afford to, to buy stuff at the store all the time and go to the best doctor. So they learn how to use what's around them and they've passed down that history. And, but we, yeah, 
we need the teachers to come back. And I think people are hungry for that knowledge and capitalism is going to eat it up and chew it and spit it back out and, and, and strip it. And like, you know, I'm a capitalist and I'm a business owner and I want to earn a living, <laughs> but I also want people to know that they need to empower their themselves by learning about these plants, because I think one of the best ways you can empower yourself and, and give yourself a lot of agency is to understand your own body and your own needs Mm. And to cut out a lot of unnecessary things, especially in your diet and food. And this is something I'm working on right now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to myself too. I'm really trying to walk the walk, you know, and, mm. and I'm adopting a plant-based diet um, slowly, you know, and I, I've gone back and forth on it for years, but, but my point is just to know how to grow your own food and to understand the relationship that we have with food and plant medicine and to have that teaching going on, because it's not, I think a part of us still has it no matter who you are and where you're from. Even if you're living in a city, you're still, you're still tapped into nature. You just probably have gotten disconnected, you know, and it mm -hmm. might even be a generational disconnect, but we still remember humans have evolved for a long time on this planet, millions and millions of years before civilization really kind of, you know, cut us off. And if we can go back to that a little bit, I think there's some real powerful healing that's going to occur and we need teachers to do it and indigenous people, um, probably need to be uh, at the forefront and and people from cultures that we still remember, I guess, you know, that, mm. that still remember that relationship because like we've talked about a little bit, I mean, colonial capitalism that has largely mm. been a white enterprise is causing um, tremendous damage to the planet. And I think to the psyche and I think capitalism in and of itself, isn't necessarily the problem it's, but it's what it seems to stoke in us, you know, and, mm -hmm. And, and cannabis kind of works against that. And that, and that welcoming um, presence you feel around cannabis people, I think is real. And I think anyone in the world listening understands what we're talking about. It's like you find cannabis people no matter where you are in the world and you feel a sense of community. And I think that is like at its core, our desire to return to a healthier way of living, like from, mm -hmm. from top down, like we need fundamental paradigm shifting change in the mm -hmm. world. We need to restructure economies to be more supportive of communities and the environment. We need to restructure our relationship to ourselves to not be so reliant on constant validation from this. Yeah. Um, and, and being able to go, you know what, I'm all right, you know, because I'm in, because I stretched with Will this morning, you know, I took an appropriate little toke, you know, I'm, 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 treating my body kind. I'm doing the right things for myself. I'm looking out for my neighbor. Like those things add up, you know? And, and mm -hmm. I think, and I, I'm not trying to be a doomsday. I really try to stay out of that, but I think the technology that we have right now is like an atomic bomb. It is incredibly mm -hmm. powerful and it's, it's going to cause a lot of damage. I think before we could, we get out of this like massive addiction. Um, but the healers and the plant people and the musicians, are going to be the ones that help us get through it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to make that difficult transition, I think, a little less painful. So I think you're doing God's work, my friend. <laughs> well, if I, if I can, I want to respond because, like, the, the cool thing, I think, when you talk about cannabis in and of itself, especially when we talk about cannabis and capitalism, I think the, the focal point for me or the focal perspective that I normally look at things is through a lens of systems. So when you look, at the human body, you have to look at the system, like how does cannabis interact with the endocrine, endocrine system, right? But then you also have to realize that just because you have a system of a regulation system that you can access and, and like get to help you with certain ailments, the resources need to be there as well. And, and when you look at like our, our capitalistic society, right? Capitalism was cultivated on various ideas of exploitation, right? And so when we look at why is it that capitalism works the way that it does, it's because in the DNA of it, it's always about, is this for profit? It's, it's, a, it's a perspective of selfishness, right? But when we look at the human body, the human body doesn't work like that, right? The, for the moment that you're a zygote, the DNA is like, this is the idea, this is the blueprint of a system of multicellular beings working together for the purpose of a whole organism's functionality. And then each specialist, specialized cell, right, is given specific tools, resources, and instructions to be that thing, mm -hmm. right? 
And then as long as it does that thing, especially when you look at it from a system of organs, right? As long as the heart beats, it is it is it has access to the, the nutrition that the stomach breaks down, that the small intestine takes in the defense of the immune system, like that, the perspective of a system is what we're talking about. And so when we look at that organic system and we compare that to the system that we have used through capitalism, um, it becomes, to me at least, very aware that we are creating a very non-normative existence in an organic environment. And so when it comes to cannabis, right, especially like earlier you talked about how like, let's highlight the people in Mexico, right? Like I like when I say indigenous, like I always, I want it to be known, like I, like I got my degree in like cultural anthropology. So I always look at things from a very anthropological perspective. Um, like I, when I look at Mexico, I look at Mexico still in like a post-colonial state because uh, there's a lot of indigenous cultures in Mexico, um, especially like if you look at the history of black people in Mexico, a lot of them blended in. Mm. Um, and if that's when you even you look at the system of like, where do we talk about um, the systems of like, like specializing how much black are you like that was local to a lot of Latin cultures, because that's where like Spain went. So when we look at Mexico, Mexican culture, like I, I include the indigenous populations within that by that uh, BIPOC acronym that I, I said earlier, because I look at the system of our, our nations as the result of the histories that created them. I look at the indigenous peoples whose cultures have consistently had to adapt to the context of the regulators, which again, if we look at cannabis, cannabis is like, we we're here to help homeostasis where, where like the powers, the government that be is like, it's, it's, it's like a way, it's, it's a very cancerous action right. of like people in power just constantly negotiating of themselves, taking resources. Like even in America, the fact that it took a year to deliberate helping its citizens in response to a pandemic where, you know, like that talks about the systems of, of how are we constructing these systems, how are we regulating these systems? And what does this have to do with the whole notion of like, well, if cannabis is counter colonialism, then that means that it's, at, it's constantly advocating for people to be aware of who they are, um, their strengths, their weaknesses, being present in the moment, understanding did that strain work for you or did that strain not work? It's, it's asking a lot of mental understanding of a systematic approach to things that our current um, government, our current society, our current culture has historically been deconditioned to do. Right. And, so, a, sharing, and a sharing of knowledge and resources. And I love mm -hmm. your, um, I love the human body analogy, you know, and it was really, really poetic. Um, and yeah, I think you're right. I, you know, when I hear you talk about the powers that be in kind of their death grip, you know, on, on the globe right now and its resources. And it's true. And this is not conspiracy talk. I mean, follow the money, you know, mm -hmm. wealth has been concentrated in the hands of, of a very powerful few. And I think it's very fear driven. I think the, you know, I always try to put myself in their position because mm -hmm. I'm no saint. Okay. If I was a billionaire, I would Maybe be both. as corrupt as all of them, you know, and I'd, I'd be protecting my money. You know, because mm -hmm. money power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And money is a corrupting force when you have that much of it. I just don't think humans mm -hmm. can, when you really realize the power that money can mm -hmm. have at that level, I think it just, you, you go crazy. Like your heart becomes hardened as the Bible says, like you're, 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 you're toast. And I think that's really fear driven, right? And, you know, that that's, that's the fuel for this. And, and, but we can start to deep charge it. Because all it takes is it takes people being vulnerable and surrendering openly, publicly in a public mm -hmm. setting, let, you know, putting the weapons down, so to speak, you know, hands up, you know, and we're, we're seeing this now. Like, and I mean, I didn't even mean to go to Black Lives Matter, but like literally like don't shoot hands up like mm -hmm. that surrender, but that like public display of surrender of like, we're being oppressed, you know, there's oppression, um, is having a toll on psychology too. And mm -hmm. I think like this battle between like 
the mentality of grab the resources while we can. Okay. Cause that's what global capitalism is doing is as nation states are kind of deteriorating in their power, the corporations are going and usurping the world's resources as quick as they possibly can to benefit primarily an elite few, but also kind of the shareholders that kind of like mm. the upper middle class of the world that kind of keeps it all together to the defenders of the global elite. And cannabis is a part of the counterpunch to it, which is why I, I think I still don't understand why it's still illegal to this day entirely, but the powers that be right, whatever they are, um, mm -hmm. you know, are very afraid of what it can do. And I, th I think you're touching on at its deepest core, what it does, because it starts to get people to actually like rely on each other and be vulnerable. It starts to untangle some of the fear um, somehow. I don't know. It's a really magical plan. And we have the power in us. Like, like we produce our own cannabinoids. That's why we have mm -hmm. this crazy relationship. Like it's like, it gives us kind of strength, you know? And I was thinking about the dabs, you know, and, and like how some, you know, a heavy stoner, you know, it might take that dab to like jolt them awake, whereas somebody else might just need to smell it, you know, or just mm -hmm. like, like plant medicine can include being in nature, right. And just being around plants and the healing, the vibrational healing that can occur. Um, this stuff is real, you know, our science is very outdated really to try to understand vibration and chi and things that the Eastern schools of thought have, have explored on a much deeper level. I mean, I want to interview the Dalai Lama someday. That's like top line goal of this podcast is to get the Dalai Lama on to talk about head change, right. To explore. Cause I really, I love cannabis and I love drugs generally a lot of them, but I don't think you need them to, to attain the awakening to attain can, you know, it's a means to it and it can be used constructively for that end. And I, I like incorporating cannabis into my meditations, but I totally respect somebody like the Dalai Lama who's like, you know, sober, you know, straight edge, right? Like no drugs, mm. no sex, just like living that monk life, but still just getting like tons of dopamine and like, you know, just naturally just like reveling in what is really in front of us, I think is a cool goal. I'm not, um, you know, I, I don't think I'll ever be there. You know, I think I'm always going to need my coffee in the morning, you know, and maybe the Dalai Lama drinks some caffeine. I don't know if he's like Amish style, but I just imagine the Dalai Lama like never needs anything, you know, <laughs> like, you know, can, can just drink air out of the uh, water out there. And I'm probably <laughs> idealizing him a little bit. I did yeah. meet, meet him once in San Francisco and I, I was, I was pretty impressed, but anyway, I, I, if, uh, if anybody's listening, they can hook me up with the Dalai Lama, please let me know. Um, but I kind of lost my train of thought now a little bit with you, but, um, I I'm just so like moved by this idea of, of cannabis being able to lead a movement of people mm. that can really, I think be something special. Like, I don't think it's hyperbolic and I don't think it's silly to actually support this concept that cannabis can actually be what saves us like literally as a planet like i think i think it has the best shot of anything to do it because of the amount that it can influence both spiritually and economic terms it just has a huge impact so mm -hmm. it's going to command attention and then us the educators can help shape it and move it in directions that i think will be very palatable to people and once they really get once that culture once that it, cannabis you know uh culture kind of is let out a little bit it can come out of the closet it can come out into the daylight and starts to have a bigger inf like imagine soon having politicians right that are that are, we have a few but not enough mm -hmm. that are just openly advocates of it you know that that you know they'll probably still have to say well i don't smoke it but you know i totally support it. like we still don't have enough of that we need we need like the green party you know like the real green party um mm -hmm to step up but i i feel it's the one area where i feel like there's really fundamental shifts happening i mean people on both sides of the political spectrum agree on cannabis i don't think anybody really has a real problem with it it's just like holding on to that last grip of power and control over people seems to be the motivation mm -hmm. um but anyway that's a huge can of worms but you just get me thinking about that stuff because this they're they're you know, it's like, we're all just kind of living, you know, you're, you're doing your thing and I'm doing my thing, but all of us collectively are part of a movement. And I just really, mm -hmm. I, I like how you're identifying that and trying to, and trying to explore that because this is a movement people, you know, people are going to look back on this period of the liberation of cannabis. 
Um, and I hope we win and that we have a global liberation of this plant and an end to the drug war globally. You know, we eradicate um, the, uh, that oppressive system and start shifting minds and allow cannabis to do some of its work because it, it really is a healing plant. And if we can get it and other healing plants out into the populations, like it's the vaccine, you know, it's, it's the real vaccine of self-empowerment and thinking for yourself and uh, coming out of anxiety and depression and, and actually rebuilding community that's that's tangible and not just a digital interface um, mm. and healing the planet anyway a lot of big topics there you know but that, that <clears throat> this that's is where this is me when i smoke so this, like this so, is yeah and that's probably why this time i don't always smoke before head change but today i did i vaporized a little bit and um so this is kind of where my brain goes but um Tell me more about your relationship to the physical aspect, because I, I, you know, a lot of people come into cannabis, you know, with like myself with an injury, you know, overcoming story, you know, of how cannabis helped them overcome injury. Do you have a similar story in that respect or? Um... Yeah. So can't, so cannabis kind of really integrated into my art. Um, because again, like when I first started, like, so so, so to kind of understand that that story, it's kind of like every art that I've been a part of has been about a simultaneous um, desire to have a connection to community and to be guided towards an outcome of 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 kind of like self empowerment as well as just reconceptualization. Um, so for instance, like gymnastics, right? Like you, you're, you're, you compete on your own, but you're a part of a team. Right. So, and, and same thing with Capoeira, like Capoeira, um, is, is designed in a way where you're in the huda or the circle on your own. When you, when you're having a game or an exchange with another person, that's just you. However, it's designed that you are aware of the context, like what's happening musically, what are the lyrics saying? Are they are they calling you out or calling you in? Or are they highlighting you? Like it's it's it makes you aware of the context of energy. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of my movement was a was was actually a desire to get from society what I was not given in my upbringing. And so cannabis kind of came along at a later time. And when I noticed that I had certain friends um, that would like we if we were to go out, like I'm not one of those people that go out to drink, I go out to dance. And so learning dance early on was it was very sacred because I learned it through like I learned it through church. I, I used to be, you know, a religious and but I was I was taught how to dance by my black community. Hmm. And it was once I realized I got older and I would start going out, I found a selective group of people that I trust and could confide in. And I noticed that my self-expression felt comfortable existing among them. And then when cannabis came into the scene, it was kind of like, okay, we're going out. I'm gonna smoke because I don't need anxiety right now. <laughs> um, and I'm going to just be present in the moment. And I noticed that a lot of times when I would get to like hanging out or performing or, or just doing stuff with movement, when I would smoke, I'd be a lot more present. Whereas when I didn't smoke, I was a lot more analytical. Um, and, and, I, and, and that's something that I have to work on where it's like being present in a moment trusting my experiences for the knowledge of response but being present enough that every motion is not a reaction right um and so that is where kind of cannabis and and, and like my art kind of come our movement come together because um it, it it even like today i had a homie hit me up and was like yo i'm strong enough to do handstands i'm like great you know what i'm saying like and it's like let's do handstands and we'll smoke we'll do handstands but like it's, it's about making people aware and bringing that you to the present moment. Because I think a lot of times our, it's hard, like you talked about earlier, like you, you want to be I, like Dalai Lama is great. I don't know if I want to be that self-sufficient <laughs> yeah. because, because for me, it's, it's about like, I notice like, especially like right now I'm, I'm pushing through a certification and it talks about the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. There's some people who can be motivated on their own accord. And there's some people 
who need that outward push. And then there's like non-normative people like myself who need a mix. Mm. So it's like, I know why I want to, sh- if, if like someone's like, let's go to a gymnastics center tomorrow, I would know, I, yeah, let's go. Cause there's community, there's fellowship, but there's also a personal resonance with my self identity, mm-hmm. which was, is basically like, I should be able to flip. Why should I not be able to flip? You know, why I should be able to do martial arts. With. So there's a lot of, of, cultivating that awareness in that moment even though again as a systemic thinker I'm focused on all these little details of doing one task but at some point it's important for us to just be able to focus on the expression of that task and so for me you know when I if if I'm if I smoke and um a, a song that I resonate with comes on the impulse of expression exists a lot more normatively than if I didn't. And it's because, again, like the movement piece for me was a way to address my mental health. So I was practicing, how do I practice community? How do I practice expression? How do I practice ownership of self? And then as I got into cannabis, it was more so just existing in the ownership of self, existing in the expression of self. And I think that's a, a that's a thing that we don't get to do, especially in our in our social, economic, cultural climate, because the impact of working a forty hour jo- you know a week job, you know, if you're working eight hours, and I say this in my class, if you're working eight hours a day, five times a week minimum, what is the psychological and physiological effect on you, right? Because a lot of us are practicing disassociation just through working for survival, right? right. You know, and then cannabis comes in and asks you to be more present. And then how many cannabis entrepreneurs and business people that you see, I, you know, or at least even in my work that I've come across and they're like, I might not even make the money that I used to make, but I'm a lot more happier right now doing the work that I'm doing. Yeah. I, and and that is the, that for me is what the connection between like cannabis and movement is. It's like just being present for yourself because you, you don't get today again, you, it, you get it once. And I've, mm-hmm. I can tell you from experience, I've missed out I'm being present a lot in my earlier life where now it's like someone's got, you know, someone's like, Hey, you want to smoke? Yeah, let's smoke. And then I will tell you that like that moment, whether it's stretching with with my class or whether it's just hanging out with a friend, I'm a lot more present than um, that. Some, than some days when I'm like, I don't need to smoke, smoke, you know what I'm saying? Um, and that, and that's kind of the, the relationship that I have with it. And I, I love how you said the impulse, you know, I, when I see people that don't regularly smoke cannabis and, and they smoke, usually there's an impulse to laugh, to dance, to talk and, and tell stories, you know, it really brings that out in people. And that's so wonderful. I love that. Like talk about, um, you know, depression shattering, talk about alcohol shattering, you know, like, you know, I had a great, podcast last week with a recovered drug addict and alcoholic who still uses cannabis and there's a lot of people in that in the recovery world that see cannabis as an intoxicant and it can be used as one Mm -hmm. but it can also be used differently and i think that's what you really are touching on that's why i love the use of can like you can smoke some weed and just zone out on the couch you know or play xbox all day that's that's fine but you can also smoke it and energize your brain and your body do you find yourself gravitating to certain cultivars? Like, are you a sativa or an indica person or, or does that even matter to you? I it, So I am a mood person across the board. So, and that's just because that's how I am as an artist. Like if, look, I'm gonna be honest, like if Katy Perry come on the radio, I'm not dancing. It's just, it's <laughs> that she doesn't invoke that movement in me. But if like, if some Fela Kuti comes on and like, because I even have a, a, a video that I made where it was just like, I smoked, I turned on some Afro like jazz or Afro, some Afro beats or, you know, and I just, I felt invoked, but I, I am more of a mood person in the sense that I, I always think about my context. So if I'm trying to be focused on like administrative stuff, I will smoke sativa. Mm-hmm. If I am trying to focus more so on physical recovery or physical or being like more physically aware, then I'll use indica. However, I am a fan of hybrids because I don't like leaning too much to either one side. Um, so I normally will go out of my way and actually mix my herbs. Mm-hmm. So like yesterday, literally, I was like, 
I'm gonna take a bit of white widow. I'm gonna take a bit of this indica that I got. I'm gonna mix that together, and then uh-huh. I, I even and I even extend my awareness beyond just cannabis because um, I have like smokable herbs too, and so it even cannabis was a gateway to just herbs. Yep. <laughs> like right. so it got me into like just understanding like oh lavender can be smoked for relaxation I've and I never really thought about that because right. lavender has been so associated with just soap you don't really I had someone make me lavender cookies before and I was like why would you make lavender cookies it's like because it's a plant you can right. make it into so yep. so I'm normally so I'm a mood person when it comes to cannabis because I always ask myself where am I like what is, what is my goal right now in this moment do I have something to do then I need to make sure that my energy stays amplified um do I need to be present in a moment then I need to make sure that I find strains or, or or cannabis and I'm more so I still have a lot of work to do as far as like understanding the plethora of strains and terpenes out there but at the very least I'm more so make sure that when I smoke it is supportive of my current mood and and goals of the moment sure um yep yeah, I've been learning a lot about that too. And, you know, the lab testing helps. Um, not all the flower I get, it has the terpene profile, but a lot of it does increasingly in California. And I can start to recognize it. You know, if I smoke mm-hmm. something, I'm like, oh yeah, that's, you know, beta caryophylline rich. I know this is going to just kind of chill me out, you know, or if it's got a lot of pinene and that's going to kind of like wake, really be a strong kind of wake up psychoactive effect and kind of starting to, to learn it. It takes a while though. And and it's different too. Like you could smoke the exact same flower on a different day and have a completely different outcome. It really depends on your physiology. How about other products, edibles, tinctures, topicals? What else do you incorporate into your, uh, into your life? All of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> same. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, I use topicals, um, especially when I, like, I, I, again, like this goes back to like just the, the context of mindfulness. Um, I literally, so, and I, I, I apologize. I promise this is not to like, you know advertise for you but like i went through awakened top of like i had a skin like irritate irritation um i don't know if it was like i think it was the sea chicago does a lot of weird seasonal stuff right now and so i just had random outbreaks and so mm-hmm. i'll go through topicals like that because it was just like i you know i don't i would rather n- use a product that i know is natural um then to and it's i'm not a fan of like really pills or like even like i'm getting vaccinated tomorrow and somebody was like use ibuprofen and i'm just mm-hmm. i'm one of those like it'll pass you know yeah. what i'm saying like because um, i just would rather do that so i use like topicals if, if i have like skin stuff i'm a heavy i love tinctures because it's super easy I'm, I'm a big tea fan mm-hmm. um tea and, like i'll have like a coffee a day maybe at max and then um i also am a fan of tea and tinctures are so, super easy to add to tea yeah. Um, so I love tinctures. Um, edibles are great, um, but you gotta be careful with edibles because, um, ed- again, depending on your metabolism, like if I'm working out a lot, I know my metabolism is fast. I know I got about a 30 minute window before I feel that edible. Um, if I haven't been working out a lot, I know I got a 45 minute to an hour window mm-hmm. before I feel anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also know the difference between like, if something has like, if the cannabis has been broken down to the nano nano particle, or if it still needs to be broken down by my body, like what is the time frame of like right. what I'm going to feel it? And so, um, I'm, I I incorporate it in just like any and every aspect. Um, especially um, part of my work is doing uh, cannabis reviews um, for certain brands and and, and and companies. And so, I get to I get to be exposed to all the different ways that cannabis is being incorporated into a daily lifestyle. Like before my work, it was just something to smoke. Now, like, I'm so happy to have CBD face wash, like, <laughs> just right. moisturizer, like, because uh-huh. I'm just like, who would have thought my skin right. could be so smooth from cannabis, right? Right. Um. So, I, as anything and everything, if it if it has purpose to it, it's it's I'll use it. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I really, you know, obviously, I advocate for for cannabis to be used in other products in a way that I think is whole plant based and and natural you know, like adding cannabis as an ingredient to just about anything doesn't really turn me on like the gas station CBD products, you know, or it's Mm. like, it's like the energy drink with CBD, you know, the, the Mm. candy bar with CBD, there's that side of it. That's always going to be there, but then there's the people making the real whole plant stuff. And yeah, the, like, let's see, CBD toothpaste, CBD deodorant, CBD face wash, CBD, 
CBD everything, you know, um, because of the hemp laws. Now we can, we can do, and are, are you a hemp flower smoker? Um, I haven't had a lot of hemp flower, um, but I have tried a bit of it. Um, but most of the stuff that I, cause I mean, cause like I do smoke like, um, like, so like, right. Like I even like CB, I smoke a lot of CBD flower too. Um, because I, I use it, I normally add it to it, but I haven't had a lot of hemp in the sense that like, I really have a strong, I know it's great. I know it has applications, but I think most of the flower that I've had has been either like um, very like CBD focused or THC focused. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I do, I, I've had, it's been so long since I've had it that I can't even remember the effect right. I had. Well, I'm just, I just mean CBD rich flower that's, uh, oh, okay, okay. you know, technically less than 0.3. THC. Oh, well then, um, yeah, okay. My apologies for my ignorance. And yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah. That's every, I'm jars. it's, it's cannabis, Bye. but we're legally, we're supposed to call it hemp. It's one of those like, <laughs> you know, things I'm, I'm very bad at, um, poli- cause I I'm very bad at like the political speaking of it all, because I understand <laughs> that as, legality a, yeah. is designed as a product manufacturer that that's, you know, it's like, if you want you kind of have to call your hemp products hemp. I see a few brands yeah. calling it cannabis, but they risk exposure. And and yeah. if you want to like sell on Amazon, if you want Facebook, you know, Instagram, like blah, 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 blah. You can't say cannabis, you know, you can't mm-hmm. say that dirty word, you know, you have to use hemp. Um, I always wonder, you know, I don't think we're going to see a, a rebellion from the private sector. Like I'd love to just see companies just start to go, you know what, we're going to allow cannabis advertising because, you know, as a, as a cannabis brand myself, you know, I can't advertise through traditional means. It's uh, very challenging. And if you do, you're, you know, there's ways to do it, but it's not technically in compliance with the terms of use of Facebook um, to advertise cannabinoid products. So you have to say, you know, hemp, you know, 25 milligrams hemp. Well, and then you get a lot of people, just selling hemp seed oil and they'll say like you know 25 mil you know 25 million milligrams hemp because it's like the weight of the product is you know 25 million milligrams of hemp oil but it's like there's that whole side so the the, you know i really hope that what they do in the u.s quickly is decriminalize cannabis and then one percent thc limit for hemp Mm. which would allow um products that would be able to have pretty significant amounts of THC to people that are 18 and over. I think it should be an 18 and over thing um, without a medical recommendation um, because there's a psychoactive effect to CBD. I think we all know that that use it. It's just not the same as THC. It's less disorienting, um, Mm -hmm. but there certainly is a psychoactive effect. Otherwise it wouldn't help for anxiety and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I, yeah, the hemp flower is cool. I think like the hemp cigarettes going to be a, a big thing someday. I think, you know, Marlboro and the big companies will be manufacturing kind of, you know, this perfect hemp cigarette to, 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 to replace tobacco. Mm-hmm. I, I have that, some, I actually have coming. some hemp cigarettes here. I, yeah, yeah. I've had, cause there's some companies that have vaporizers that do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been able to have, and they're really cool, but they're but due to the size though. They're very like quick. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so like it's really good but it's just like they're kind of little shorties yeah it's just very like i well, it's because they got to be rolled right you know the the machines that the, the, the tobacco industry has perfected at, at scale and mm-hmm. and the hemp cigarette isn't there yet i mean it's because yeah. hemp it, it's stickier than tobacco it requires a different dry and curing and rolling process anybody that rolls joints in cigarettes because they used to be a cigarette smoker knows this but you can't roll a joint as tight as a cigarette it won't it won't burn right you know, mm. it'll, it'll always be going out. So rolling the perfect cigarette is, is a lot easier said than done. And it, there's still quite a bit of R and D I've never seen the perfect hemp cigarette yet. Like that comes out, you know, the perfect Marlboro looking, you know, branded in a nice mm. pack that's tight, but not too tight. That's just right. Um, usually they're being rolled in machines that have the cone, you know, sticking up and they kind of just get the material dumped down onto it. So it's a nice mm. loose wrap but that cone look is good for people that smoke like us we don't mind a big fat cone but i think for your average cigarette user they're not going to transition from the cigarette over to that and i think the discreetness of a actual cigarette looking uh hemp product would be a big selling point for it to where people wouldn't know you you could smoke one in your car and people aren't going to know that you're consuming mm-hmm. a you know a cannabis product but yeah i think it's i you know, I'm so excited to see what happens with the industry. I just hope that the industry is allowed to flourish and not, mm-hmm. um, you know, overregulated um, out of existence. 
I don't know if we're going to see any real fast track of federal legalization or the Biden administration. I think we can be hopeful, but I, I think it's pretty doubtful. Um, yeah. If you have any thoughts on that, uh, chip in. Uh, my thoughts on government in general. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I just. I, I'm putting this in I, quotes right now. Yeah, I just. <laughs> well, it's just that, again, I'm a systemic thinker. And a lot of my education has been about, like, I've, I've had a class where we were like, let's talk about tomatoes. And then we went through the history of tomatoes. And it was just like, but do you understand the impact of just the history of tomatoes? Because they normally, <laughs> like, like the fact that when, when Italy first saw tomatoes, they thought they were poisonous because they were red. And right. then everybody, everyone now equates tomatoes to like Italian culture even though that's still a Western perception hmm. that it, it is like, we make pieces because y'all like it. Like, no, right, you know what right. like so it's, it's just, so my understanding of systems is when it comes specifically to the government is that the DNA of it is very slick, cyclical. Um, and so even though I, I think Biden and Kamala are so much better than what we had before, I the organization of our government does not yield me much hope at this point right. based on the history of our nation. Sure. And, and, I've, and, and that's why when it comes, when things come, and, I, and when things come to government, I, I'm more so, I, I, I hate, like, not even, I don't hate it. I'm just, I just kind of be like, we need to start over y'all. <laughs> we, we just kind of got to start over. And, and that is like the, that in our culture is just, the very like that's the most non-american thing you can say is like mm. well what's wrong with america and it's just like you you don't how can you know what freedom is if you bind yourself to the constraints of your present you know um i don't think america is willing to acknowledge the past so that it can because right. because like you have to acknowledge like that's how immune systems work. They acknowledge what was there to prevent immune to create sure. immunity for what will come. Right. So and I think I, that's yeah. where it comes to government. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And when I hear people, you know, say things like, you know, America's, you know, the greatest country in the world that has ever existed, you know, and all that cheerleading, what I really hear is nothing to improve on here. You know, everything's good, you know. Um, just preserve the status quo. And I think, mm -hmm. you know. There's a slice of the population, obviously, that would probably prefer that. But I think for um, for the rest of us, yeah, I can, you know, being disillusioned, you know, especially for the black community. I, I got nothing to say, man. I, 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 I you know, um, you're getting a vax tomorrow. Um, do you care to talk about that at all? Because I think that's a, that's a powerful <laughs> statement. I'm I'm pro vax. I want people to get I, vaxed. Look, I am. No, I'm I'm pro. I, I'm just. I'm always going to be skeptical. I'm just, I'm I, at this point in my life, I just, there's an inherent skepticism. Oh, me too. I mean, one, been, yeah. One of my big enemies of my whole podcast is the pharmaceutical industry. I don't trust mm -hmm. them as far as I can throw them, mm -hmm. but I got the Pfizer, Pfizer vax because I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's the smart thing to do. Yeah. That's the one I'm, I believe I'm getting tomorrow. Um, and, and, and it's, and, and on it, so that like, to be honest, like as an individual, yes, I'm skeptical. As a professional talking about health and wellness though, mm -hmm. it is my responsibility to make sure that if I'm facilitating, then especially in-person classes, people can't come to my class and get it from me. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so that outweighs how I, my skepticism right. tenfold. So yeah. that, so even when it comes to things like that, like even when it comes to government, like that, that's the beauty of logic, right? When you have sound logic, your emotions can just step to the side because they're just like, that's not about how I feel. That's just about the process. Right. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, that sound logic comes when you're in a position as a business owner, for example, mm -hmm. where you have to kind of think outside of your own attachment to your feelings about a topic or a subject. Because I certainly understand vaccine skepticism. You know, I'd, I'd love to have a chat with somebody about it. You know, I, I've looked into it, the mRNA technology quite a bit. I think it's super cool technology that's going to be really important on this planet. Um, mm -hmm. I hope they work the kinks out, you know, because it's in my mm -hmm. body. 
but I'm not too worried about it. It seems actually pretty simple technology when you actually look into it. It's not simple. It's very, it's, it's actually easier to understand than I think some people might, it's very difficult to do because it's at such a yeah. controlled microscopic level that you have to have the sophisticated machinery and understanding of these um, agents. You know, it's like they grow it out in E. coli and like, and then they get rid of the E. coli. It's a really interesting process. Pfizer is very transparent about how they're manufacturing um, these products. And as a product manufacturer myself, I'm like, oh, I recognize that equipment. Like, oh, they're using all the same equipment that we have in our labs. Like, you know, it's just the Pfizer lab, you know, um, it's just same stuff. You know, we're cooking up cannabinoids. They're cooking up yeasts, and molds and growing out eight stuff, you know, like um, it, I think it's fascinating. Like drug manufacturing in general is really fascinating to me. And I think that the pharmaceutical industry deserves all of the skepticism, but I think in this case, they're actually doing the right thing. I mean, they're giving this thing away for free. So there's obviously no profit motive, uh, at least not in the present. Um, but anyway, I think, I think it's good. I, you know, I want to talk openly about that stuff and, you know, I'm always interested to hear other perspectives, but I think it's important. I know the African-American community is one of the most skeptical of the vaccine. So I think it's good that the people are, are, are demonstrating that it's safe, um, safe yeah. to get it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because and, and I think that you brought up a great point, especially with Pfizer, because it's like you talked about transparency, company transparency. How if, if the if the pharmaceutical industry as a whole, if you can go and ask someone where they grew their cannabis, what was the process behind it? What's the strain? How much cannabinoids in it? What's the like when you mm -hmm. get that information, you feel so much more reassured about what you're right. putting in your body. If that could be applied to just not not just the pharmacy, you know, but even just government, like that changes the process, right? You know, I, so yeah. th that is that. I think that was a great point that you brought up because of the fact that it's just I I, I understand like especially you know studying anthropology. I've I've not, not beyond the Tuskegee experiments. There's a lot of situations where the government. Um, has just been, or even researchers, has just done things where you're just like, I want to unlearn that. And, right. and, but that transparency piece, which it changes how industries operate. Right. And that is like, that is something that I wish pharmaceutical companies did equivalent to the cannabis community because right. it's like for the amount of regulation that cannabis currently has right now, if that was just applied to just those two you know, sectors, America would change. Right. Holistically. Right. Yeah. No. And to your point, I think you raise an interesting, um, an interesting issue, you know, right now the internet, you know, governments operate under a lot of secrecy. They don't like transparency. Neither largely does the private sector, especially pharmaceutical companies. Cause you know, they're worried about trade secrets and, and things like of that nature, legitimate concerns. Um, but we're living in an age now with the internet and the free exchange of information. People want transparency. And I think that's kind of one of the fundamental debates we're having right now in, in the world is how much transparency is, is acceptable, right? And with WikiLeaks and all this stuff. And, and I think the powers that be, right? I mean, you know, you know, the government and Fortune 500 companies, the private sector are kind of worried that people can't handle the truth basically. You know, I think the CDC is a perfect example of that. You know, if the CDC had just been honest with people from the beginning, I think there'd, there'd be a lot less skepticism of the vaccine currently. But, you know, the CDC, you know, they told people masks don't help when they knew that that wasn't true because they wanted to make sure N95s were available for frontline workers. Totally noble effort, but totally backfired. And that just continues to build on skepticism that people have about government agencies, about pharmaceutical industry. So yeah, I, I think what Pfizer did is actually really great for them as a company. It was a smart move. Moderna as a counterpoint declined to open up, um, you know, their facility to, to outside um, eyes. So it's going to be kind of like a company to company decision. And, you know, maybe, maybe Pfizer loses some, you know, now other people can look, oh, that's how they're making it, you know, and oh, that's mm -hmm. the equipment they're using. And they can, you know, they might've lost some trade secrets by doing that, but they obviously made the decision that the benefit was greater. But I, th but I think, I, I think that, yeah, I think that there's a, a disservice when people don't want to open it. Cause especially like, again, when we look at the cannabis, industry, there, I, I can't tell you how many times I've met people just in the cannabis community 
that whether they were a content creator, an entrepreneur, a business owner, that when I met them just was like, oh, I'll just, I'll just show you how to do it. Or right. tell you how to do it. Like, th- like that makes people a lot more welcoming into spaces um, when there's not so much of a secret. Like I understand politics is a part of human nature. So that's something that it's gonna be, you can't really get away from. But when you, when you are a part of a community or, cause you gotta realize like, governments are composed of people companies are composed of people everything at the baseline starts with communities and people and so when you look at just like a lot of like like a lot of reasons why i'm gravitating more and more and more towards the cannabis community is because of just every time i just am around them I, i just feel this sharing of information and and i feel like that is something that's very important that needs to be having because especially i mean because even just looking at that highlights what colleges do, right? Mm-hmm. Like colleges aren't about educating anymore. They're about, I mean, they're educating you or at least getting you credentials for whatever job, but like mm-hmm. they, it's a profit thing. And so the thing is, is that when, why is it that when we look and go, well, you know, people are like, well, cannabis is the new, you know, gold mine, right? And it's like, well, yeah, because people there, there is the underground aspect of it and there's the people who don't want to share and trade but then there are people who are just like i just want to talk share and build this community and if i meet someone along my path i'm going to help them if if they if they steal from me cool that doesn't really say anything about me it says something about them i'm not going to let my heart be changed mm-hmm. and so i think there's this movement of people especially when you look at like just so, social equity applicants right like there's a movement of people who are going cannabis is becoming profitable who else deserves to profit we need to share this information with that community yes. and so like that's why i i'm, I'm highly gravitating towards like just I, I'm just trying to like in my mind like figure out how can I do everything that I was doing for the last 15 years with the cannabis community because I feel as if they'll be honest with me about my work if, if they want I haven't yet to be told my work was like trash it's like great idea but this is some things we can improve upon I've heard that mm-hmm. and and I'm so appreciative of that because having spaces where dialogues are open you can be transparent um that impacts a lot in our society a lot in our culture and just and like if you have a friend and you can be transparent with that friend that's a long-lasting relationship most of the time because you're like i went to my friend i felt this way i had this conversation we understood where the truth of the matter was i was happy that i was able to be transparent i'm happy i was able to see myself for my strengths and weaknesses and now i trust this person even more because i was able to have that fellowship with them and so that's something that I'm really happy and, and looking forward to um, getting more and more in the cannabis industry, because I just think other industries, especially like, again, when I look at even just performance arts industry, it's just so competitive. And I'm just like, why do we need to compete? Like, you might be a, an acrobat and I might be an acrobat, but are, are you six foot 260? You know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to flip differently. <laughs> so... It, it, I don't really, I'm not a fan of, of just this, this, just like, I, I think there's a lot to go around. I think the scarcity mentality is just something that we've learned through capitalism, but that's the cool thing about the cannabis culture. It's just that, like, I've never heard anyone say, we're going to run out of weed. Like no one, mm-hmm. no one has said that. And even if, even if that concept does happen, there are, there's always organizations or people who are like, it's cool. We will figure it out. Like the, the people like, just yeah. show up. Right. So, yeah, I, no. I geek about that aspect of just cult because, again, from a, from the perspective of cultural anthropology, is like, how is that inherent in this? Or I mean, I know I say how facetiously, but it's just like, how is this industry? This how does how does just the very act of growing, cultivating, using, sharing, facilitating cannabis? How how is just the act of that impact people? when everything else in our world is just not on that same frequency with, with the exception of like, unless you're talking to the Dalai Lama or hanging out with Donald Glover, right? Like unless you're hanging out with specific people in or groups and organizations, it's just, it just baffles me how we, we just, that mentality just can't ripple through our culture. So you, you probably know about the pygmy tribe in Africa as an anthropologist, um, they're probably the oldest people on the planet. Mm. and anthropologists have been studying them for you know since the late 
1700s i think and they're a, they smoke cannabis all day long like that that group of people <laughs> have incorporated smoking weed and everything they do and singing songs and they've got a song about every activity they do during the day they make they they seem you know the oldest people on the planet we might have something to learn from them and they're still around and largely still doing what they do you know i'm sure they've become westernized to some extent but not much from what i understand and um you know like the maybe you're listening to the music from the pygmies like just like the field recordings are un are mind-bending i mean like uh, animal collective like you know that hipster band of brooklyn like pretty much copied the pygmies like it's like some psychedelic trippy edm like mm -hmm. that they're doing that they're using with like water that they're just cupping with their hands and just their vocal cords and just making unreal music in their daily tasks not with instruments you know using the instruments around them of the bucket they're using to collect water and the water itself and rubbing leaves together i mean it is like probably some of the coolest music i've ever heard like straight I mean, up i mean i don't want to brag but like african people are dope um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh but 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 it's but it's i mean but that's an institution though. like that right. so because again this so the same thing that they do is the same thing that happens in capoeira right because when you think about it music is oral tradition it's literally about instill because the what the funny things when you look at western history or western culture we'll make songs about nothing it'll literally be a song like just to put a commercial fruity. on the, yeah, it's like just to put a commercial on, you make a song. But but the thing is, is that music in those cultures where they're very historically, um, they 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 have a lot of purpose. And so like even in Capoeira, like they the, they sing songs while you play Capoeira, but the songs also have a purpose, not just in the oral tradition that they pass on, but they also have a purpose because you'll sing certain songs based on the content of how the two people in the game that they're playing with each mm -hmm, other. Mm -hmm. So if someone's being aggressive, you might hear one song as opposed to if the, you know, if someone's being, you know, very, if a game looks very nice, if there's a nice conversation and someone starts singing like, you'd be like, oh, like that can mean like play a beautiful game or it right. could be like, you should play it. It's a context. So right. I really like African culture because I mean, I'm biased obviously, but like, um, but it's, 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 there's a lot of, purpose because even like you said in the process of going through their natural day they bring self-expression to the forefront right you know and and that mean that that shows you just again from a systemic perspective how like my body does consistent homeostasis each and every day and the consistent modulations of all the little bits and pieces that make me who i am but then we also have to talk about well what makes me laugh what like in the process of doing my work like there was a woman who literally said, take a deep breath and imagine saying thank you to each and every cell and aspect of your being. And then imagine that they are saying thank you and you're or like to you and then you're welcome, right? Mm -hmm. Even if we look beyond the, the like, oh yeah, that just sounds positive. If we look at like, what does that conceptualization, conceptualization do to the individual? Right. It, it's bringing purpose to a moment of work about being present, understanding the parts of you, understanding that you have impact, right? Do you think about the cell that falls off that right. or the cell that kills itself so you can keep going because it's programmed wrong? Like, right. do, it, then what yeah. does that say about our society, right? Um, it, so, it I'm sorry. It, no, no, I, and then this is cool because, you know, I think like you're talking about how the pygmies, like it's an improv, you know? it's not pre-recorded it's an improvisation based on the players involved and and the dynamics being exchanged and you know as a musician myself like you know music is tension and release you know it's the build up and the release it's the drop it's all that and that's life too and like what a funner way to communicate like if you if you're really pissed off at somebody and you can express it to them in a song you know and a certain drum beat and rhythm and then they come back at you and then in a couple minutes, you, you realize that like all the tension is completely dissolved and you like just made a cool song. You like actually created something together like like poetry does this, too. You're able to express things mm -hmm. through poetry that cannot be said through prose and allowing the human brain to kind of speak in riddle and rhyme and to resolve 
otherwise impossible conflicts through that mm -hmm. rhythmic exchange of vocabulary and dance is, is really powerful medicine, man. I mean, I, there's like really something to that. I mean, you know, I, I used to live in Big Sur and um, the Esalen Institute used to secretly host um, conflict resolutions between the Soviets and the U.S. I mean, like high level people, um, it's like top secret stuff. And they would, you know, they would go to Esalen, okay, which is the, the human potential movement. A lot of alternative approaches to communication are explored there. And these people would go there and, um, you know, some of the, you know, it, it's possible that we have, you know, that we didn't all get blown up because of some alternative communication techniques taught at the Esalen Institute, you know, that helped mm -hmm. the U.S. and the Russians come together and see eye to eye. Because if, you know, if you sit two ambassadors down at a table or two presidents to negotiate nuclear treaties, you know, like forget about it, uh, but get them in a hot tub with a massage and then playing some instruments randomly and you might suddenly people will start to break down a lot of the tension and it's i mean it's really really powerful and as a musician you know exactly what i'm talking about and but people that aren't musicians just you know dance we can all move our bodies we can all i think we're all musicians like every everyone mm -hmm. is um you know you don't have to um you know be on soundcloud to be a musician just you know use you know, use rhythm and poetry in your life, try to incorporate it a little bit. And I think that's what dance does too. And I'm not much of a dancer. Like I, that's, that's an area where I would like to improve, you know, I have, <laughs> I have no shame in, in singing, you know, I, I'll sing in front of people. I have no shame about that, but dancing, ask me to dance. And it's like, I close up really quick. So um, mm. I've got, I've got some work to do there, but um, I love the concept of, of, you know, these alternate communication tools and, and how cannabis can, can be used with the body expression. And, and obviously the pygmies are onto something. Like, I think like they've clearly figured out a real deep communication tool with the plant and, mm. and, and with song. And, and it, it, it's just cool shit. People, people listening, please go out and listen to some pygmy music. It'll, it changed my life as a musician. I mean, it, it really did. Um, and, well, and real quick, I, yeah. I, yeah, please. I just want to say that that is at the core of what I'm trying to do. Like, cause honestly, like I told you like the last 15 years, I've been in all these different artistic spaces and at the core of like, so you said that the, 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 the purpose of your podcast is to meet the Dalai Lama. Like I want Grind and Grow Chicago goal. to- It's a goal of mine. Maybe, not, yeah, maybe I mean, it look, is the look, purpose. Look, look, I don't know. But you got, I'm learning <laughs> that you have to say it as if it's going to happen because that's right. how you work towards it. And so sure. for me, it's kind of like Grind and Grow Chicago is like a step in the ability to facilitate that culture. Because again, having a background in, in cultural anthropology having a background in Capoeira and which is again, like I was able to go to Brazil because something, some African, some Africans who fought for their freedom, like however long ago, like I was able to learn it and it got like, I want my, the, the spaces that I facilitate to facilitate a culture. Mm -hmm. to because I think that is the important, like you, just like you say, like the, the, the pygmies have a sense of like freedom of expression and purpose. Like I want people to find that again in themselves because I feel like in our culture, it's like once you're 18, society could care less. Right. But the thing is, is that not everyone has a normalized start. And so if we start to create spaces, I mean, that's the whole part, like, you know, conversation behind like reparations and stuff like that. It's if we create spaces that allow people to acknowledge the disassociation of self or the disassociation mm -hmm. of, of trauma, if we allow them to deal with that, then we create these communities, cultures and institutions that are always putting people for first not just in the clients that they they have but also in the administrative processes themselves mm -hmm. and so that's that i want to have a space that one day where i can look to the cannabis community and be like if i want to perform it's for the cannabis community why because the cannabis community welcomed me they they saw me before i saw myself um I, if i want to teach a class i'm going to teach it for the cannabis community why because the cannabis community told me they acknowledged my worth before they handed me my first dollar bill, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's what I want my space to be, which is cultivating that culture through, you know, yeah, some people might walk in the door because of cannabis, but whether you decide to smoke that day or not, the culture should be ever present. Right. Yep. No, agreed. And, you know, I find a lot of that too. It's not like, you know, people aren't looking at how many followers you have on Instagram. And like, it's like, if you're a part of the culture, it's like, it's like, you're, you're a friend, you know, like, like, come on in. 
And um, I love that about it. Ta- explain what capoeira is for people that don't know. And I, I only know a little bit, so I'd like to learn mm-hmm. more about it too. So capoeira is kind of like an all encompassing. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, the, the most generic way that you explain it is like, it's a dance, it's a fight, but it's a fight that's a dance, but it, it from a more in-depth analysis, um, Capoeira is a, it's, it's an oral tradition that is also wrapped in movement, that's also wrapped in the structure and the organization of it, because Capoeira has all these angles that it approaches simultaneously. Um, there's a book called The Ring of Liberation, where an anthropologist, like, studies Capoeira, and, and he talks about all the different aspects, but Capoeira in and of itself, it's, it's, it's a cultural preservation practice which also embodies community which also embodies oral tradition which also embodies self-empowerment which also embodies contact contextual awareness um it's it's about recreating a historical perspective as you presently move because if you look at the martial art aspect of it when you're playing a game and it's called a game because the, the mentality is I do not attack my friends. That's why you're here in the, in the art, uh, like they'll say comrade or camera. It's because the person that you're playing with is supposed to be a friend. So I'm not, I'm not going to spar. I'm not going to attack you because you're not my enemy. I'm playing with you, even though we all know basketball is a game, football is a game, but they can be just as aggressive, right? Mm-hmm. Same with Capoeira, but, the, but there's a conversation piece of I know what you did I saw what you did I was aware but because you did that I'm going to do this but I'm also going to set up this thing four steps down the road it's it's, it has that in movement Mm. it has the same kind of perspective through the music because the music that you're singing depending if you're contemporary or traditional it comes from somewhere there's a historical context to that Mm. as well as you sing certain songs in re in in awareness to what's happening between the two people in the in the hada or the circle that the hada means circle, um, as well as the energy between the end of pe- the individuals that make up the circle. The circle itself is composed of people from this of the, who are participating with you. Um, so that energy also comes through the singing. It comes through them responding to what just happened. So capoeira is it's 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 yeah it's a it's a oral tradition. It's just a cultural preservation practice. Um, that has become an institution through the educators and the masters who, who just continuously pass it on. And, but it's also something I will say that um, to, that's very sad. It's, it's, it's kind of under threat of Western culture because a lot of Western culture is about profit, but a lot of indigenous or just a lot of the, the history of, of Capoeira is based in the the fight and liberation of African peoples during the colonial rule of the Portuguese in Brazil, as well as after, um, just trying to keep the culture of African traditions alive. Um, but it's 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 something that it's it's just very multifaceted, and it's something that honestly to me that it, it heavily impacted my life because. Mm-hmm. There's a like there's this notion where in or I'll say honestly for me. In Western culture, I might be seen as like an angry black man, but it was in Capoeira where it, I was seen as, you know, there's a fight to be seen. Mm-hmm. There's a fight to be heard and there's a fight to be understood. However, I was also educated. There's a way to be heard. There's a way to be seen. But there's also the but in response to the game of society and culture, right? And so it, Capoeira was a p- place where I was, you know, just kind of, it was like, be big, you're big, stop acting small, own mm. your space, right. own yourself, own your body. Mm. Um, and then once you have it, it's, it's fun because Capoeira can go from, you know, the martial art aspect of it all, but it can also go into all of a sudden a samba huddle ha- happens and you're, everyone's just playing at a different tune and we're dancing, we're hanging out. And so, yeah, Capoeira, I, I, I want to go like, I'm trying not to geek out too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> but yeah, no. It sounds like a just, it sounds like a almost a way of life, you know, not not just yes. something you do on the weekends. I mean, this is really yeah, you a way can, of approaching people, life. There are people who go just to hang. I mean, but you you can go for so many different reasons. Like 
There are people who go for music. There are people who go because of the physicality. There's people who go for the culture, the, the history. There, it's it's similar to cannabis culture because there's a lot of different reasons why people are attracted to cannabis. Right. Is it are you here for recreation? Are you here for medicinal? Are you here because you need help sleep? Like all these different reasons, but it's still a unifier. And I think that it's 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 you know Capoeira is similar in the sense that like cannabis culture is a unifier process. Mm -hmm. It's the purpose of it is to bring people together, create those communities. And so Capoeira is similar in that sense because it's funny because I have meet people in Capoeira who smoke and it's very funny because like if we go to academy, we're not going to smoke. You you don't go to class and you do that. But then like if I'm hanging out and we're just hanging out on like the beach or something and we're smoking, it's like, hey, let's play a game. And there's an entirely different game that'll come out in those spaces. So (laughs) it's just, yeah. It's, I want to go deeper, but I don't. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But I, <laughs> it is, it's very awesome, especially just in a. It gave me a different perspective of the African experience right. in a colonialistic world right. than what America was willing to show me. It sounds like it, an important tool for for anyone really, but maybe especially for African African Americans that are trying to heal a little bit around that identity, um, and trying to maybe you know connect to embrace that you know something that they've been made to feel ashamed of probably for a long time and and something that they have to hide and feel small you know and and to be big in in that Um, i think anyone can relate to that um it's really powerful i've always been intrigued by capoeira but um i will be mindful of cultural appropriation and um i'll probably stick to just you know uh I don't even know what kind of, you know, my dance, like I said, dancing is really an area I need to improve. I know how important it is because of the intelligent movement, you know, and the expression, but I really close up for some reason. It's really something I need to explore. Um, but just being physical in general, you know, and, and, and just like moving my body, you know, and spending a lot of time, you know, in front of the computers and the phones and, and just like, you know, looking up, you know, to the sky and just like being more intentional with all your movements and, and awareness and, 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 how you're posturing yourself and your gait and, and all of that, I think really plays into how we start to shape our mental image of ourselves. And um, so I think it's really important. I think, you know, there's a study that came out of the Netherlands that it's like a 10 year study on what, what's like the best thing you can do for like your mental mm-hmm. and physical health. And, and this government study concluded it was singing, dancing, and camping, or in other words, being in nature. So being, being connected to nature, literally singing to like, maybe on your own, but better in groups and then dancing and, and okay on your own, but better in groups. And there, there really is some deep fundamental healing. It's all, it can also be used as propaganda, right? Like a lot of cult leaders also know this and use nature singing and dancing to brainwash people. Um, so it, it just shows you how powerful, you know, the, mm-hmm. these, these tools really are because once you start kicking up these chemicals, you know, it's how like Scientology works too, right? Like, um, you know, it's a big thing in LA and Hollywood is, you know, the Scientology movement. And one of the things they do is they, they offer you a lot of value up front and I've never done it, but I've like dipped my toe into it just to kind of see, and they give you a lot of value. They do a lot of work, you know, for free. And they really guide, they can guide you through a lot of healing. Um, and then they kind of, they use that, you know, as, as the, as the carrot to, to pull you in, uh, to what I would consider a cult, but, um, you know, it's just interesting how, how powerful these tools um, of organizing principles can be. You know, you get a group of people singing together as a group. Like mm-hmm. if I'm a, a preacher, you know, and I get everybody, it's like I, I've i got them in my hands now. And, and it's a real mm-hmm. responsibility what you do with that. So as the teachers, as the learners, um, you know, that exchange is is really kind of sacred, you know, and like that role of teacher, especially when teaching these movements, you know, it does really strike me as something that, that's really powerful and really meaningful. And, you know, you, you people are going to really kind of fall at their knees to you, right? Like, that's why it seems to always be the story of the the yogi who starts to get some fame and that then ends up being the sex addict crazed, you know, a, a person. It's just like over and over we're hearing this story. It's just constantly, uh, you know, whether it's in the Catholic church or in, in the Kundalini tradition or whatever it is, it's just like these leaders are falling um, because they're human and they're imperfect. And, and well, that, that power and that, you know, the energy that they probably get in their hands is, is difficult for many of us to, 
to control, you know, our worst instincts. Well, and then that's because there's a process to power, right? Um, and I think it, it follows the laws of nature. So there is a process to go from a sink, from a zygote to a baby. There's a process from going to a baby to an adult. Mm. Um, the laws of nature dictate that for something to, something to grow, it takes time and there are processes that must be followed. But in a very Western uh, get rich quick or everything has to happen like super fast, you can bypass that. Mm. And, and that's why when you look at, you know, artists or celebrities or, or self-proclaimed masters of something, um, there is there's something that's always off and it's because like even even for me i am like i've been teaching 15 years but i'm also trying to figure out how to be a master like it's a it's a it's a, i've been trying to find all these spaces to be a master of myself and so when you when you miss out on the very process of evolution and you go straight from zero to whatever position of power without going through those those steps it is very easy to be lost in the in the darkness of who you are and i say darkness not in a sense of evil because i think there i think in a spectrum of of humanity where it's like the light is just what is and then the darkness is what is unknown Mm -hmm. right there are processes that must happen on our i mean you know as a business you know owner there's processes that must happen on our own because it is through the work in which we become empowered. But then once we, emp- once we do that work, we can then share it, talk about it and be known for it. But if we're not doing that work over here and I'm still struggling like with movement, like I, I'm trying to figure out how to make movement an everyday consistent thing. And the administrative work sometimes takes me away from that. And so it's a process, it's a balance. It's a constant reconceptualization of where you are, where you started, what you know, what you don't know. And I just think that there's a lot of people that you know that you reference where it's like you can tell that process didn't happen and so as they get to that position they become lost in themselves because there is no anchor and i think also i think you know they didn't have a teacher right like maybe there wasn't somebody there to maybe they did really excel quickly you know like they they did the yoga and the meditation they were doing the work to get the benefits and they were kind of like you know awakening themselves to this you know incredible consciousness and um you know, this how in the sixties and seventies, it was like on every street corner, there was like, you know, a guru and, you know, America's kind of gone through this and, and other parts of the world at different times and all the soothsayers. And, um, but, uh, I lost my train of thought now because, um, because of, because no, of can- cannabis, maybe, I, maybe it wasn't that important, you know, and cannabis well, no, is like, no, I know you were, I knew you were going, cause you, you were just, you were just saying that there's a lot of people who, who, I mean, cause we talked about it earlier, even with cannabis, right? Anything can be a codependency. Anything can be a coping mechanism. Even something as beautiful as spiritual practices or as self-empowerment can be a disassociation from right. an, an actual deeper trauma you need to address. Right. Um, so I think that's where you were going. Right. Um, I yeah. mean, not that specifically, but I, think, but I think you were going like, you know, there are some people who went through the whole processes, right? Like even oh, Buddha the, the teacher, said, right? The teacher. Well, yeah, but even Buddha said, don't highlight me highlight the work right. and then what happened they started going y'all join buddhism you know what i'm right. saying like right so it's 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 there it, i i wish i had the amount of time to like go into the depths of like you because i am I, one of the, i'm a very existential person but like <laughs> um <laughs> i, I but feel no, like <laughs> here's my theory i feel like at some point you know, and i've obviously never been there but i feel like at some point you attain let's say like you tap into the source, you know, mm-hmm. you meditate 10 hours a day. And then finally, you know, nine years in out in the cave, you know, like, boom, something mm-hmm. happens, you know, the light hits you, you're, you're awakened, you're enlightened, you're, you're floating. I think in that moment, you realize it doesn't matter. And that's when you realize all the power, you know, and maybe you can levitate at that level, but like, it doesn't matter. Like, you're not any more powerful. You're still exactly the same. And like, Mm -hmm. I think it's that humility 
it's like in the never ending story, you know, and Atreyu goes mm-hmm. past the, the oracles and is so brave. And then he has, then, then all the greatest warriors falter because they have to look at their true selves in the mirror and their true selves. They might have all the armor on and there's, there's handsome and strong. And then they look at themselves and they're actually really weak, you know, and just to like confront that truth and be okay with it. I think, and and I think a lot of people like maybe you work and you attain all the wealth and power and knowledge and you, you talk to the source and the source says, give it all up and go back to zero because it doesn't matter. And most people go, no, but it does matter because I've worked so hard and look at how powerful I'm and I'm flying and, and the universe, you know, God, whatever you want to call it just doesn't care. It's not impressed because it's impressed by everything all the time. And, and there is no hierarchy (laughs) at all. Mm -hmm. So that's just all the mental construct. And I don't know, that's just my theory of maybe why these people that do seem to attain this high level in life, all these gurus crumble and, and go to quote unquote, the dark side, because I think their ego goes, Oh, I thought I was going to get here. And then I was going to get to the next phase. And then they realized that there was never any phase to begin with. And like, they're just mm-hmm. stuck being their boring self that they've always been. And and all the like lights and, and the show, the, the smoke and, and all the stuff they're doing, the illusion they're casting out, even to themselves, is all fake, you know? Mm. And all we really have is just our boring selves. In the, and, I, and I say boring selves just because I think it's grounding to realize that maybe like none of us are really that special and that we're all just kind of here in this primordial soup and we have agency and, and we have purpose, but it doesn't mean that you, your purpose is better than anybody else's or that you're further along in your journey, journey than it. I think that's such a humbling concept that it's a mantra I try to repeat to myself. It keeps me out of negative thinking, out of comparing mm-hmm. despair, out of feeling like I'm not enough because I haven't attained a financial level of success or some type of material level of success. Um, if you can really just embrace the nothingness, you know, and, and that's right, you know, the Buddhism, you know, that, that's the work, right? Like, it, it, I mean, that's the concept of, of trying to not be attached even to success and failure, like just, just mm-hmm. letting everything be, like you said, the light, you know, is what's known and the darkness is what's unknown. And, and that's scary. That's why when the night sets in, you know, it is that, that out, that moment of like, uh oh, you know, now I can't see, now I'm afraid. And then we start telling all these stories to ourselves that are untrue, largely. And Which is be- interesting because what do we do at night? We sleep, we heal, we rest. Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting that we look at the unknown as such a terrifying thing because the way our bodies have even just developed have just to find comfort in the middle of a part of the day where we can't even see our own surroundings, mm-hmm. right? And then when we see the, yeah, just because something is seen doesn't mean that's what it is, right? Something can be in plain sight and still be an unknown. So it's, it's, it's one of those dichotomies that I kind of live at the intersection of just like multiple dichotomies where it's just kind of like, you know, so is above and so is below, you know, just because I might be at this level does not mean that there's not something bigger than me, but I also must remember that I was once a little bit lower than where I am now. And so like, just understanding that the hierarchy is not like this. It's more so just kind of like, where are you at any given space and time? Remember where you came from, but know you're moving forward, but also be appreciative of this moment is fleeting, right? It's the, it's the same thing as like, find, like someone going, hey man, I got the dankest, you know, whatever for you. And you swing, it's like, yeah, that's good. But it's like, you still have to, like, you have to know that the joint's going to go out at some point. Right. 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 You know, so it's only, you're not going to be able to hang on to it. Yeah. Yeah. You got to just let it it go. It is and let it go. Well, I really enjoy talking to you and, and like this little song and dance that you and I have going (laughs) is, is really cool. And I want to repeat it. And I just, I I love everything you're doing and I totally support it. And I want people to tune in to, um, to the movement and instruction and teaching that you're doing. And, uh, I think people get a lot out of it, but thank you for, for coming on the show today. I really appreciate having you. Um, and hopefully one day we'll get to, you know, maybe you can help me uh, break out of my mold a little bit on my dancing. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Thank you, Levi, for having me on here. It's been a blast. Um, always a pleasure. All right, man. Talk to you later. Peace. Talk to you later. Peace. Bye. Thanks for joining me today on Head Change. 
the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I've been your host, Levi Strong. Full transcripts of today's episode are available on our blog at awakeneveryday.com. If you'd like to listen to more podcasts like this, you can join the conversation on Anchor FM and YouTube. Until next time, peace.